I'm Jennifer Montone. I'm one of the psychologists in the ADHD Center. I'm trained as a school psychologist, so this, kind of, this topic is very near and dear to my heart. I'm also joined by Dr. Steve Soffer, who's another one of our psychologists, and he'll be up here in a little while this evening. Um, so tonight, we're going to be talking about you know, the difficulties that kids with ADHD have in school in particular. So we know that ADHD is a chronic disorder, and it does affect people from childhood all the way through adult years. So we're, not, we're talking about our kids who have ADHD, but we want to be thinking about the long term kind of impact as well. And that's something that as you develop your plans to support your kids in school, you do want to be thinking about also. It's not just about this teacher and this grade, but the long view for what you want for your children over time is important. Um, so you have the handouts. You can see that um, we didn't want to get into a whole lot of detail around what ADHD is, um, but you have some information there that we want to remember we're talking about a neurodevelopmental disability. So the front part of the brain here is involved in ADHD. This is also the part of the brain that's really involved in what we call executive functioning, time management, planning, organizational skills. We also see kids who have ADHD have trouble with shifting their attention from one thing to another. Um, and one of the other big areas of difficulty is not just in behavioral control. We know that kids with ADHD can be very behaviorally impulsive. But we also know that there's emotion control difficulties for people who have ADHD. So those of you who see your kids get very frustrated when they're facing challenging tasks and they may fly off the handle very quickly, to some degree that may be partly because of ADHD's involvement in the situation, and we need to think about that. When we're talking about ADHD, there are three different types of ADHD that we want to think about, or three different presentations. The most common is the combined presentation. The second most common is what we call ADHD inattentive presentation, and that's the difficulties with focus, organization, concentration, follow through on tasks. And then the least common, and the one we actually see most often in our little guys and our preschool students, is the hyperactive impulsive presentation. So those are the kids who may be very active, they have trouble staying seated, they're on the go all the time. So again, backing up a little bit, the combined presentation, therefore, is sort of both of those things together when we think about inattention and hyperactivity. Elevated levels with respect to what we would expect for someone the same age and gender as your child. Okay. Um, when we think about each of those types of ADHD and how that plays out in the school environment, the kids who have the combined presentation often have difficulties with academics as well as with classroom behavior. So those kids, you may be hearing from teachers that your children are having <coughs> trouble being disruptive in class, they're not remembering to raise their hand, uh, as well as having trouble finishing work on time. They're among the last kids to finish tasks a lot of times. The kids who have the inattentive presentation are generally quieter in the classroom. They may be more of the daydreaming kinds of kids. They're having trouble finishing their work on time. They are struggling to maintain attention to instruction. So therefore, they come home and they can't tell you what they learned in class. They don't know what happened to, from class to homework because they weren't paying attention. So those are things that are most common difficulties for kids who are inattentive. And I see several of you nodding. So I see that there's some experience in this area with your children. So then when we think about that and kind of what ADHD is and then how it plays out in the classroom, we have to really be considering you know, the things that are more obvious. We see those direct effects when we consider that. You know, you're getting phone calls from teachers because your children are not performing at the level that they, the teachers would expect that they should, given their ability level. They may be having trouble getting along with other kids in the classroom. They may be having trouble getting along with adults in the building because they're having trouble following directions. Those are things we can see. They're more apparent. We can tell when a child isn't living up to their academic potential, for example. The indirect effects, though, that are really just as important and also things we need to consider when we're thinking about how to support kids with ADHD in school are related to things that could happen at home that may pl then end up playing out and carrying over into the school environment, like when you may be having a hard time interacting with your kids. There may be difficult parent-child relationships because they're struggling with behavior at home. Then 
kids are learning from you how to manage their behavior and emotions. If your behavior or if your relationship, I'm sorry, with your child gets to be a bit disrupted because of this challenging behavior, and then they start to learn that they are failing to meet adult expectations that can carry over into the school environment. The piece about self-regulation that you see up there, though, is that kids, when we get frustrated with our kids, we may have a tendency to yell, to become emotional and angry ourselves. They learn from us how to manage their emotions and behavior. So when kids see us angry and reacting in sort of big emotional ways, that's how they learn how to deal with frustration. So that's where it's really important that we consider what we do at home to support our kids who have ADHD, and that helps them learn how to manage their behavior in interactions with other people outside of the home, okay? Uh, the question was, you know, you're trying to support your kids, and you want to make sure that they understand that the message you're trying to deliver is important to you and is a serious issue, right? right. How do you do that without being emotional and, and conveying, like, sort of overly emotional response? Is that accurate? So th I'm going to answer your question only a little bit because that's actually a big question and it, it really is sort of the crux of the issue for parenting a child who has ADHD and we need to stay focused on the school issue tonight. Some of the strategies we're going to talk about later today actually will relate back to that and help you. Um, when we think about how we deliver a message, kids with ADHD a lot of times are hearing corrective feedback. You did not meet my expectation again and here's how and why. And so what we want to try to do is set up a whole system that involves home and school that sets up clear behavioral expectations for what the child should be doing and then recognizing when they do that. So that it, there's more of a focus on what you've done well than a focus on where you're failing to meet expectations. Now that said, there still are those times and that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we need to do here tonight. But um, to help parents with that, we would recommend family behavior therapy or kind of more ongoing parent management training to help because that is an issue that does take more than one quick recommendation I can offer you tonight. Um, but the global picture is we definitely want kids to know what they should be doing and when they have done it. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. What we also see, though, in terms of how ADHD impacts school functioning in ways that are, may not be as obvious is how many of you have gotten phone calls from school about something that's gone wrong in the classroom? How many of you get more of those phone calls than you get hearing about when your child has done well? So how many of you don't want to pick up the phone when you see your, your school's uh, number on the caller ID? Right? So that's what goes on. You know, you are getting more negative feedback than positive feedback about your children's performance as well. And then it, you naturally and understandably might become avoidant of the school. I don't, I, can't, I don't know what else to do to help them. I don't want to talk to this teacher. And there's a little bit of a potential for an adversarial relationship between parents and schools which can ultimately have a negative impact on the way the teacher is viewing your child. So we want to think about how we can turn that around. What the question was is that her son has a, what they're calling a smile chart to give the child feedback about his performance, but they're having a little difficulty getting the current teacher to implement this consistently. The, the main goal, one of the main goals of tonight's workshop is to help you think about what you can do as parents to help teachers use strategies that might be effective in the classroom. And also think about strategies you can use at home that can be helpful for your children academically. So what we know about school success is that when we as parents use effective strategies to support child behavior at home, we're setting our kids up to be successful in the classroom. They learn appropriate behavior at home. That translates to how they interact with people outside of your family. School success obviously is also linked to the extent to which we're able to support learning at home. Kids, kids start to learn that education and learning is important to you and is important to their future. And so that kind of learning orientation that you can start setting up as early as preschool helps them in the long term in terms of thinking about that you want them to be kids who can study, teens who can study, and carry their effective learning habits into the classroom. The other thing that's really important that we will talk about a lot today is the extent to which parents and teachers can work collaboratively 
it can have a really strong impact on school success. Now, there are times when that can get challenging, not just when we might have a, a teacher who may be less responsive, but when we get into the high school years and you're talking about six, seven different teachers and kids who like don't want you as involved because they're trying to become more independent. Um, so there are different, you have to think about how you can set these things up in a way that's responsive to your developing teen and the situation, the fact that you still do want to be supportive of their education and in good contact with the school. We also want to be thinking about the importance of using the right strategies. That's what we consider evidence-based strategies, things that we know from research can be most effective for kids with ADHD. And we'll talk about a lot of them today. In the context of the right relationships, so it's really important that we have strong, positive relationships with our kids and we are able to have a strong, positive relationship with the school. That's going to impact the extent to which the school is going to be more motivated and involved in working with your student as well. The, what we want to think about, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that we always want to be keeping the long view in mind. So where it says there, avoid creating long-term dependencies, we don't want to just be reducing expectations for our kids because they have a disability. We might need to reduce expectations to some degree to meet them where they are today, but you want to be thinking about what you can do to put strategies in place to help your kids build skills to become increasingly independent over time. An example I often use when I'm talking with parents about this is that if we simply give an inattentive child more time on a test, Without doing anything else, most of the time, all we are doing is giving that child more time to be inattentive. So we need to think about what else we're putting in place to encourage task orientation and task completion. That's not to say that extended time isn't helpful. It's independent of anything else alone, it might not be all that your child needs to ultimately become independent. So. The bottom line of everything I just said is really that we have children kind of in the middle of all of these systems. The family, the school, the health system, if you're working with a provider to address symptoms of ADHD. And the really important issue for you to always be thinking about is how do you get everyone working collaboratively and working on the same page? A lot of times we see families here for family behavior therapy and it seems like the parents are putting in a lot of effort kind of working down one path, focusing on home. And the school is putting in a lot of effort to support the child or adolescent at school. And there's not a whole lot of interface between what's happening in, in both of those environments. And what that really does is result in a lot of duplicated effort. And you know nobody has extra time on their hands right now. So if we can be getting parents and teachers working together more collaboratively, we're not only sending consistent message to the child, which is really important, but you're also maximizing the use of the resources that you have to try and support your kids. And that can be sort of the most effective way of supporting children and adolescents as they're learning to deal with ADHD. So when we're thinking about collaborating with teachers, then how do we do that? How do we build that kind of alliance? We recommend that this is something you consider right from the start of every school year before there's an issue. Consider setting up a partnership with the teacher or teachers or a key person in school. Again, as your kids get older, it may be a guidance counselor or someone who kind of is serving as your child's champion or go-to person in the building. Um, you want to be thinking about how you can let those people at school know that you're there, know that you understand that your child has different needs than other kids in the classroom, and know that you want to be an active supporter. So again, before there's an issue, before we start to recognize that kids are having trouble finishing their work on time, you already know because you have the history of educational difficulties. So you want to kind of come at it in a proactive way. We also want to make sure that we're listening to the teachers, though. Like we were hearing with the example that was just presented about the smile chart, the current teacher was saying, I don't have time to be doing an additional intervention to support one kid in my classroom. My response to that often is, I hear you. These teachers have a lot of kids, and they all have individualized needs. However, I know that you're spending a lot of time supporting my child individually right now anyway. So if we can get a strategy that's effective in place, you're likely ultimately to see behavioral improvements over time and be able to spend less time 
focusing on my child. That's the goal. You may be asking them to do a little bit more right now with the end point of helping your child function in the classroom in a way that looks the same as other kids or closer to what other kids are able to do. So if you kind of take it that way in that approach, yes, I'm asking you to do more now with the goal of reducing the burden later and try and pull them in in that way and recognize that you know, you've been dealing with ADHD at home too. And what has worked for you, you put in a lot of time and energy parenting children who have ADHD and then teenagers who have ADHD. They need a lot of extra support. So if you can come in with that understanding and you know, you're all dealing with a shared experience here, it's helpful when you acknowledge, I know my child has difficulties and I want to work with you and support you. Anything you can do to, to affirm what the teacher is doing we're going to talk about some ways to shape appropriate child behavior. We're going to talk a lot about giving positive reinforcement or praise. It works for teachers too. Okay, So think about everything I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes. Think about how you can maybe use it to let the teachers know you recognize what they're doing and you appreciate their positive efforts to support your child. And then think about you know, what have they done before. A lot of times we're going to talk about what basically is equivalent to what we heard is the smile chart, sticker chart, point system. There are a lot of times where I've seen those things work and then I've also seen places where they're problematic and we're going to talk about some targeted areas where you're going to want to think about ways to strengthen those systems. But you want to hear, if you're coming in and you're suggesting a whole bunch of changes to what the teacher is doing, you want to hear what they've tried, recognize that they're trying, and then try and problem solve around where can we maybe make this easier for you to use and more effective. So you want to think about that. Meeting often, providing support, showing up, showing that you're present is really important. If you're going to ask the teacher to do something, think about how you might be able to offer something in return too. Like how can you help that teacher implement the plan that you're asking for. Okay, so these principles sort of help illustrate a little bit more about what I've been talking about here. Um, this was published by Russell Barkley in, a, in books for parents of children with ADHD, but I kind of added the teacher piece because really this is relevant for anyone working with an individual who has ADHD. These kids need very frequent and immediate feedback when they're meeting your expectations. They also need to know immediately if they're not. So if we're talking about a punishable situation, they need to know in the moment. Punishing something two days later, it's already too late. They don't know what happened and they don't really remember the circumstances. We want to let them know when they meet your expectations and you see they're at the point of performance. That means when you catch them doing what you need them to do, as close in time to when that happens, you need to let them know. That's really hard in a classroom when there may be 25, 30 other kids running around. So that's something we want to think about for teachers. How can we help them get to your kids right as your kids are doing what they should be doing in the classroom and catching them, let, letting them know that they, should be, that they are doing what they should be doing. The other thing that we need to think about, and I'm going to get into this a lot in the coming slides, is we really want to think about incentives or rewards before we punish. And I'm, I'm not going to get too much more into that right now, like I said, because that's coming up. But for kids who have ADHD also, time is hard to kind of understand. When I'm playing my video game and you tell me I have 15 minutes left to play, it's like that. When you tell me I have to finish my math worksheet in the next 15 minutes, it's like four hours. The time isn't the same depending on what I'm doing. And so helping kids understand time in a, in a visual way using a timer, um, making it a little more clear that way can be really helpful. We'll show an example of how to do that later on this evening. Um, think for younger kids, thinking about problem solving, making these activities more physical, giving kids things they can get their hands on, manipulatives. This is something elementary teachers are doing naturally for young kids, but it may need to be used for longer term for kids who have ADHD. Consistency is critical. When we get these strategies in place, they need to be implemented consistently over time. It takes a lot of work to be a parent or a teacher of a kid with ADHD. We recognize that, you know that, but this is a really important thing that you know, we always need to be considering. 
Now, the number 10, where it says act, don't yak, what I see happen a lot of times for teachers and for parents is when we're trying to respond to a problematic situation, we use so many words. Why did you do that? You shouldn't have done that. It should have gone this way, and blah, 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 blah. And now you're like Charlie Brown's teacher, and they're not listening to you anymore. So as much as you can get a concrete plan in place, this is what I expect you to do. And when you do it, this happens, period. There's no more conversation and a lot of chit chat around that. The other thing is address the situation and then stop talking. If you're providing praise for something that your child has done well, in that moment, that's all you're recognizing. You did a really great job finishing your homework on time tonight, period. Not, you did a really great job finishing your homework on time tonight. I really wish every night could be like that. Praise statement and then kind of, you know, little backhanded comment on the other side of that. So we can just be very careful and thoughtful about the words that we're using, be a little more efficient. You also know where your kids have their most challenges, right? So if we're thinking about strategies we're putting in place in class, you and the teachers know maybe math is a harder content area for your kids for a variety of different reasons. Plan ahead for that. When you're entering the math period, what are you going to do differently to set that up to maximize success instead of waiting for a situation that is you know, kind of falling into failure. Remember also those last three statements though, we are talking about a legitimate disability. We want to make sure that your teachers are recognizing that too. This isn't your fault. It's not the teacher's fault. There are going to be times where you try strategies and they work really, really well. And then there are going to be other times where it just isn't working today. You're dealing with people, too. So your kids are thinking and acting and responding. You can't always know that everything is going to go exactly as you planned. Sometimes you need to forgive and just move on and get back to what you know to be effective and helpful. So we want to think about the bottom line here is that we're thinking about ADHD. We talked about how this is a disability and these kids have legitimate needs. But at the end of the day, for any person, behavior is learned, whether you have ADHD or not. The chances of those behaviors continuing over time largely depend on what happens before the behavior, which we call antecedents, what is going on in the environment to sort of set the stage for the behavior situation, and also the consequences, what happens after the behavior. When I say consequences, I don't just mean if you do that, there will be consequences. That's usually a negative thing. But consequences can be anything that occur after the behavior occurs. A reward is a consequence. That can set the stage for the behavior to happen again in the future, for example. So we want to think about the ABCs of behavior when we're trying to develop plans to support our kids or to try to change teacher behavior to get your teachers to get involved in the plans that you're trying to implement also. Your teacher's behavior is learned as well. So be thinking about that. Remember, what happens before the behavior sets the stage for you know, the likelihood of whether that behavior is going to occur. And what happens after the behavior also increases or decreases the likelihood that that behavior might continue. Now you see under the B for behavior there, we're saying observable and measurable. So we want to think about if I were to walk into your child's classroom, would I be able to say, yes, he's doing the behavior the teacher is talking about, or no, he is not? So paying attention, it's a little hard to tell sometimes if someone's paying attention. I can tell if a child is paying attention if he completes the worksheet that's expected to be completed at the end of that 15 minutes. He handed in a completed worksheet on time. So there's the difference between is, is that observable and measurable, or is it a little bit harder to tell? There are a lot of times I've been in classrooms where I think there's no way that kid has any idea what's going on, and then he raises his hand and answers a question accurately. So you know, my observation of what that child was doing was different than what actually was happening. So what we want to see is, does he answer questions accurately? Is he remembering to raise his hand when he needs to speak? Things like that that you know is, are observable and measurable behaviors. Now, on the flip side of things, the, the consequence side, 
like I said, there are two different ways of looking at consequences. There's the punishment. If you do that, there will be consequences. And there's reinforcement. The difference here is that reinforcement increases the chances that a behavior will happen again. Punishment decreases the behavior. Sometimes we inadvertently reinforce things we're trying to punish. So think about this. If you go into a grocery store and you go down the candy aisle and your child starts crying and now you're embarrassed because you're in public but your child really wants a candy bar and you give the candy bar to stop the crying, you now rewarded the crying behavior and the chances that that's going to happen again the next time you go into that grocery store go up. So that was actually reinforcement. Sometimes when we think we're punishing, we might be actually providing reinforcement. So you want to think about that. Make sure you're looking at the circumstances. Just always remember when you're trying to use reinforcement or punishment, reinforcement results in learning. When we're using this to support good behavior management and we're reinforcing appropriate behavior, we're teaching a skill. We're teaching our kids what they should be doing to meet our expectations. If we punish all the time and just say, don't call out in class, don't call out in class. If you call out in class, you're going to get sent to the principal's office. That might stop the calling out, but it's not actually teaching them what they should be doing instead. And actually, disruptive kids who end up getting sent to the principal's office more often than not are getting out of doing something they don't want to do. So really, we've rewarded them. So you have to be thinking about what was your end game in using that consequence, but also what was your child up to or kind of getting involved in in the situation that resulted in the consequence you used? Why were they engaging in that behavior to begin with? That might affect how you think about the consequences that you use, okay? Attention is a really powerful consequence for kids with ADHD and for kids in general. But a lot of times for kids with ADHD, this is where they end up. They are getting involved in a lot of not OK behavior, calling out in class, being disruptive, failing to finish work on time. And that's when the teacher's all over them and actually giving them a whole lot of attention. And then when they're finally working quietly and they're getting their work done, the teacher's moved on to another student and is not paying attention to the one who's typically disruptive. So what we're doing is paying a whole lot of attention to not okay behavior and not paying attention when they're behaving well. That's teaching that if I need the teacher, I need to be disruptive and then she comes over to me. Instead, if we can pay attention to the okay behavior and ignore the stuff that's inappropriate, they start to learn, if I want my parents' attention or my teacher's attention, I need to be doing what they expect me to do, and that's when they pay attention to me. It's kind of hard to get teachers to buy into this sometimes, because if your kids are engaging in disruptive behavior, they feel like they can't ignore it because it's disrupting everyone else. I understand that. I really do. But at the same time, it's not actually going to be necessarily the most effective way of supporting your kids in the classroom and reducing the problematic behavior. So we'll talk about some other ways that we can make a really concrete strategy for getting this in place, an opportunity for kids to get more attention. The goal is if your kids are in this kind of situation right now, the pie chart where there's more not okay behavior than okay behavior in class or at home, what we need to do is start paying more attention to the okay behavior, even if you have to work really hard to find it. And what you want is then crowding out some of the mild not okay behavior. More time engaging in okay or appropriate behavior means they have less time to be failing to meet adult expectations. It's really hard for a kid to be doing both things at the same time. Either they are meeting your expectations or they're not. When you can get more okay behavior left there, then there's less time that might be sort of the higher end behaviors that you need to punish. If we're talking about inappropriate language, you know, kind of physical aggression, those kind of things that get left over. Safety issues, property destruction issues, I'm not recommending that that's something you'd be ignoring. That's sort of the high end, not okay behavior that gets left. We talked a lot about the importance of using attention and reinforcement to increase the rates of appropriate behavior, right? So you can do that 
with verbal praise and just specifically letting them know when you catch them doing the right thing. I really like how you came to the table as soon as I told you it was time for homework, right? Telling them exactly what they did, when they did it. But the reality is for kids with ADHD, just verbal praise often is not enough. It's not a powerful enough reinforcer to make it kind of worthwhile for them. Homework is really hard. I've just spent all day trying to behave in school and now I have to get through more work. It's like a marathon and I am exhausted. And so praise for coming to the table. Yes, I like that, but it's not powerful enough to get me to do something that's really hard for me to do. So what we find is if we use something like a token system, it's an opportunity for more concrete reinforcement that can really help sort of up the ante to encourage your kids to do things that are hard for them to do. The goal really is to make sure that there's a structure for very clear, very frequent, meaningful, and hopefully immediate reinforcement for appropriate behavior in your kids. The benefit of a token system in terms of increasing the immediacy is that you can say, here's a point in your or a token, a chip in your jar right now. You can earn time on your iPad later. You can't be giving your kids 30 minutes of time on a video game every time they do one thing that meets your expectation. But this allows for something concrete. It can be very visual. They can see their progress and then help the longer term or kind of more time intensive reward be put off until later. It also often is helpful as a system for parents. If you see the jar right in front of you that's reminding you, I need to catch my child doing the right thing. I need to be consistent using my behavior management strategies. I've seen teachers use token systems in classrooms for the whole class. They may have a jar anytime they catch the whole class doing one of these classroom behavioral expectations. A token goes in the jar and then there may be a group reward. Those things can be really helpful for, for kids who have ADHD in class too. The point is, again, with the token system, we're teaching our kids what they should be doing and then we're encouraging them to do that behavior over time consistently. Many times it's not that kids with ADHD don't know what they should do, it's that they have trouble performing the skill consistently over time. The more you catch them doing it once, it increases the chances they'll do it again and again and the point is then that that behavior becomes more of a habit or kind of a reflex. So that's why we want to be doing these kinds of things. So for those of you who've done this, this may seem kind of familiar, but we can think about a lot of different ways to do it. Here's an, a one example. You might hang a chart in your kitchen in your child's bedroom with your clear behavioral expectations. You see there we recommend two or three. A lot of times when I see token systems that families set up or that are set up in classrooms, there are like 12 different behavioral goals. That's really hard for the adult managing the system and it's also hard for the kids to remember exactly what it is that's expected of them. But a lot of times if you look at your behavioral expectations, they can be grouped under more overarching goals or behavioral expectations. Follow directions the first time kind of covers most things that parents and teachers are asking kids to do. Okay, so we want to think about that. Are there ways you can group your behavioral expectations? And then you want to think about what kinds of points you're going to assign. And remember that this is going to require you or the teacher to do this consistently. These systems can get very out of hand very quickly. You can come in and we can develop together the most technically sound token economy system that is incredibly complicated and I can guarantee you it will not work because it won't be feasible for you to do consistently over time. So if you can't do it, it's not going to be effective. Keep it simple and make sure that it's something that's feasible for you. So we want to think about as your kids meet whatever the goal is, you give them their points, whether it's one chip. Each time you follow directions the first time, you get one token in your jar. Or if, if you're asking them to do a task that has multiple steps, your homework routine has multiple steps in it. If you get six out of the 10 steps or more, you earn 10 points, for example. There's different ways you can do this, but you have to think about what's feasible for you and what's meaningful to your child. And then think about a reward menu. 
this is a great place to get your kids involved. You want them to buy in. Something that those of you who have elementary school students, something that those students find rewarding is going to look totally different than the parent of our high schooler over here. So we have to think about what is your high schooler want that's going to be motivating. Is this access to the car? Is this access to opportunities to spend more time with friends on the weekends? Something that's reasonable and OK with you and acceptable and fun, exciting, motivating for your children. There are certainly ways that you can modify it. You know, your teens might not want a jar with marbles sitting on the kitchen counter, for example. But you know, when you do X, then you can have the car this weekend. When you do this, then you can, you know, spend more time with your friends. Um, so there are certainly ways you can modify so the principles are the same. Um, there are things you know, you, maybe you're keeping track of points earned. They have apps, you know, that are on your phone um, that might not be as visible especially if there are other kids in your house and your teenager is feeling a little bit embarrassed about it or whatever. You, so you have to be considering where your kids are coming from and what's feasible for you. But at the end of the day, the principles are the same. When you consider when you do whatever the behavioral expectation is, then you get X. And you know, to the extent that you can make it concrete and clear, yes, it can work for older kids as well. When, as they get older, it's going to be even more important that you get them involved in it too, though, so that they feel ownership and they can tell you when you've kind of reached the limit of their comfort with what you're trying to do. Um, so if you think about that. Um, the other thing we can do with older students too is to get them to start thinking about how they can reinforce themselves. So when I finish this report that I have to do for a class, then I can do something. And you may need to help them learn finishing this report for class is really long. I, I need to learn how to break that thing down. When I write my introductory pages or page, then I can take a break and spend a little bit of time on my computer or texting with my friends or looking on Facebook. Um, and when they kind of learn how to monitor themselves, that can be a really good way to help them increase their ownership of what's happening. Um, increase their awareness of how ADHD is affecting their lives. So for those of you who have young kids, they need even more kind of external coaching and support. Older kids still need coaches, but your role starts to look a little bit different because you want them to be taking ownership and, and taking the lead on a lot of these things. Um, and then the bottom part there is thinking about when do the kids have access to rewards? When are they getting to sort of cash in the points that they've earned? It's not necessarily going to be every you know, 10 minutes or multiple times a day. It might have to be you know, in, in the evening after you've finished your homework it can be your reward time. For older kids, you can let it go even longer. Younger kids are probably going to need cash in opportunities almost daily. Older kids can delay their gratification a little bit longer and kind of say, OK, what did I do over the course of this week? What can my sort of reward options look like on the weekend? OK, so now I'm going to actually pass this over to Dr. Soffer, and he's going to speak with us about homeschool notes or daily report cards. This is our sort of terminology for what you were describing as your smile chart from earlier. So I'm going to go through two strategies. One is using uh, something called a daily report card or a homeschool note. And the other is uh, working on uh, homework strategies. Um, why we cover homework strategies, I'm not sure, because everybody, parents and kids alike, love homework. So the strategy is really to increase the amount of homework. That's a joke. You're allowed to laugh. It's OK. If you don't laugh, I just keep telling them. Traditionally, uh, notes home from the teacher are kind of like the phone calls that, that Dr. Maltone was mentioning earlier. right? You, you saw the note, or you know, your child comes over and says, Mommy. Uh, Miss Smith sent a note home today, and you can kind of feel inside the, oh, not a note. Um, so we want to, you know, this strategy of using a daily report card or a homeschool note is taking that uh, same approach, if you will, uh, but making, trying to use it in a way that meets the principles or meets the goals. Increasing communication uh, to build a better collaborative relationship, uh, in, uh, putting in place uh, the principles of identifying goals for the child uh, to perform each day, as well as increasing the use and regularity of positive reinforcement. Um, so, that's, so we want to kind of take that same setup, but use it in an effective behavioral, from an effective behavioral standpoint. 
Um, so the, the purpose of daily report cards or homeschool notes is to improve uh, homeschool communication. That's a key component of any sort of collaborative relationship, whether it's uh, between, a, you know, in this case, between a teacher and a parent or a teacher and a student. Uh, allow parents to monitor on a daily basis. So that is the consistency that uh, Jen mentioned as one of those 14 principles of giving feedback consistently, immediately, on a regular basis. Um, and that's that next point. And then really using it as a motivational tool. <clears throat> so instead of the, you know, that note home causing you know, angst and anxiety, uh, the note home is a regular occurrence. Um, and it's really in place even if the child you know, simply just met their goals. They didn't do anything spectacular. They didn't necessarily have a great day. They had a good day. They did what they were expected to do. And we want to put a, put a technique in place to recognize that uh, because that's often the things that start to fly under the radar, if you will. Um, so developing a, a daily report card is, uh, the first thing we want to do is, is think about goals. We want to think about specific things uh, that indicate what the child should do. Uh, what is the goal? Or what are the goals that we want the child to perform? Uh, we want to uh, indicate how we're going to rate the goals. Um, you know, you mentioned before, like a smiley face system. If they if they did it, they get a smiley face. If they didn't do it, I imagine they, there's lack of smiley face or fr you know, frowny face. Um, we often want to structure these in a system that that gives chances for incremental performance. So if you kind of did it, we want to recognize that. Or if you did it okay, we want to recognize that. You may not have done a great job, but but boy, there was an effort there, and you, maybe you made it halfway, and that's better than not doing it at all. Um, so we often want to put a, a scale in, with a zero being you didn't perform it at all. A three is you did a great job, and you know one, one, two are there. You know you, you, you tried. There was an effort there. It's better than nothing. Um, and we want to develop these in collaboration with teachers. So it's really a tough forms. A, it's a tough relationship with the teacher um, if you. Uh, try to implement this sort of thing without communicating or, or you know, engaging a teacher in the process. Uh, much like if you said, you know, you went and started to talk to a teacher and said, well, instead of doing this and this, why don't you do this and this? I kind of think about it the same way if the teacher came to your house and said, well, instead of um, you know, putting your, bed, your child to bed at, at 9 o'clock, why don't you put them to bed at 8 o'clock? That would be a lot better. You'd be a much better parent if you did that. Um, you know, I, I don't think many of us as parents would, 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 you know, we may appreciate where the teacher's heart is, but not necessarily the method of the delivery or what they're trying to do. So we want to make sure that we are working collaboratively with the teacher to put something like this in place and, and you know, build it with them, uh, not, not, not just for them. We also want to make sure the goals are appropriate. And I mentioned on the prior slide, we want to think about these in terms of what should the child do? What is the goal? Um, and their goals are not supposed to be absence of behavior necessary or don't things, but really what are, what are the sorts of things that we would want the child to do. You know, when we want a child, when we want to uh, teach a new skill or teach a new behavior, we want to use a reinforcement based approach, <clears throat> which means that we want to phrase the goal behavior in a manner that it can be rewarded. Um, so instead of calling out, for instance, uh, we would have raise your hand before you speak. Uh, instead of uh, you know, follow directions um, or do what you're told. We would have something like follow directions the first time, a bit more specific uh, to what the goal actually is. Uh, follow directions is a little too vague. Um, and instead of, you know, don't get up, uh, we would have something like stay at your chair, stay at your desk, stay in your area. Um, you, know, uh, you know, sometimes it's, you know, I've had teachers with really restless children, you know, keeping contact with the chair is good enough. You know, they might stand, they might kneel. Uh, but you know, not insisting on sitting, but insisting on if you're at your, your desk or your table, you're, you're at least where you're supposed to be, uh, which, is, which is a reasonable goal. Uh, the next step is to, is to do the, uh, the mechanics, if you will. Once you have the goals in place, and you know, building the goals is really a, a, you know, part of that collaborative uh, piece of things with the teacher. You know, remember, it's the teacher who's with your child day in and day out, so they have a really good sense of what, are, you know, what sorts of things would they uh, like to see go better. Um, when I build these things with teachers and parents, the question I ask the teacher is really, you know, tell me, you know, two or three things. If Jimmy did them better, uh, you think he'd have a better day at school? Um, and those usually, you know, we start to work with the wording, and those are usually the things that turn into goals. Um, but you have, to, you know, some of the mechanics are including a place for the date, so you know what day we're talking about. Um, how many? We'll talk about points in a second, but how many points are they eligible to uh, to get per day? 
Um, you know, we want it to be signed by the teacher and the parent. Uh, you know, our, you know we, we don't want to give children opportunities to, um, to uh, falsify documents or things like that. So we want the, the teacher to, to sign off or initial that, that you know, they filled it out today. Um, and, a, and a place for comments where a teacher can put, you know, Billy did a great job today. Or Billy did well uh, if he just works a little bit harder at X. Tomorrow's going to be an even better day or something like that. Sometimes teachers will use the comment space for remember to bring home the permission slip or something like that as well. And it becomes just a really nice communication tool uh, that, that's ready made. You know, I usually, especially for working with elementary school age children, I usually don't require a child signs it. But what we do require or what we really want in the spirit of this is that it gets reviewed with the child, uh, preferably by the teacher, but absolutely by the parent. By the teacher can be a little... Uh, challenging uh, for teachers. It's one of those things that, you know, while it's an ask of the teacher oftentimes, but it's a hard thing to insist upon uh, at the end of the day. You know, all the kids are getting all their stuff together. It's a madhouse sometimes. Uh, but, you know, certainly it's one of those things when your child comes in from school and, you know, they get their snack and they're kind of chilling out for a little bit. Um, you know, you take that out of their, their, their uh, daily report card folder and you start going over it with them. Okay? So definitely reviewed with the child. Uh, we want to decide, you know, what, what's, the, uh, what's the, the goal number of points that the child needs to reach. We set a threshold, basically, so, uh, because we're going to tie this into a, uh, a prize or a reward. The, the goal in the daily report card is often something that will, uh, will, will tie in a goal um, for uh, the token economy. So if you get 18 points in your token economy, that equals three poker chips. But if you get 20 or more points, that might equal five poker chips or something along those lines. Uh, we want to make sure the goals that we're uh, putting in there are attainable, though. Uh, something where there's a really good chance of success. Um, so uh, they, you know, the child can really start off on a positive note. They can, they can kind of get a good taste for what it's like to be successful and get rewarded. So in the beginning, we may want to make it a little bit simpler uh, so they really have a really great chance of getting that successful experience under their belt and then gradually raise how many points you need to reach the threshold. Uh, it's always better to start small and build rather than start really high and have a child have an experience of, I, I never reach it. Or even have the, it's really, you know, it's disheartening for the, uh, the, t uh, the child. It's really disheartening for the parent as well. You know, I've had many a parent came on, come in and say, I'd love to be able to give them the reward, but they just never reach the goal. They don't, they don't do what they have to do to reach the goal. And the conversation ends up turning to this, is if we temporarily reduce the goal, we can, you know, kind of make it a lot more likely that a child will be successful and we can build on little successes. Um, and so, you know, we set targets of, you know, we want to build this in a way that three out of five days they're going to get their, they're going to get their reward at the end of the day, or, you know, they have to get 50 to 75 percent of the points per day to be a successful day, just to set the, you know, we don't want to set the expectations too high. We're setting expectations, um, and we're setting very clear expectations, but we don't want to make them uh, in a way that's going to be really too hard for the child to get. So uh, we already talked about working with the teacher to uh, develop the note. We also want to work with the teacher on how this is going to be communicated. We want to make sure it's a clear message coming from the parent on how this is working and from the teacher um, so the child really has a good, um, a, a really good idea of what's going on. This is definitely a scalable intervention or a scalable approach for a high school student. Um, I think the keys to keep in mind is that you, you, you know, whatever the mechanism, the specific mechanism is, that you want to keep the principles in mind for, for what you're trying to do. So what you're trying to do is to increase communication between yourselves as parents, you know, a student, and the people at school to see what's going on every day. Um, you're trying to get a joint sense of what the goals are. What are things that if you did these things better, you would be more successful? Um, and you're trying to you know, provide some external motivation because there is not sufficient internal motivation to, to make tough things happen, uh, like do your homework or bring home your books or whatever, or pay attention in class or, or get your classwork done. Um, you know, there are, there are different ways to do this at the high school level. Certainly you can have a high schooler have, you know, a, a, something that they take to each teacher at the end of each class, although I find that that often isn't that acceptable. Uh, even if a child is accepting of their diagnosis and accepting of their needing help, it's, it's pretty, it can be potentially quite embarrassing to go do that. It also might be really hard to do on a daily basis uh, to get that kind of feedback. So an end of the week summary, if you will. Oftentimes what we try to do is we try to enlist the uh, enlist somebody, whether it's a, a particular teacher, a coach, uh, or a guidance counselor to, be a, to play a mentor role, uh, to kind of play the central conduit for information, 
um, to share between parents in school and, and the student in school. Um, you know, who can collect from each teacher at the end of a week specific things like what percent of the classwork was finished, what percent of the homework was turned in, um, what were the scores on tests or quizzes. You can also do these sorts of things through PowerSchool nowadays as well, or, or whatever, you know, if, you're, if your school has some kind of online checking system. So there's, there's ways to put the principles in place <coughs> while, while also trying to um, be sensitive to your child's needs. In the end, um, it's also probably very necessary for your, your child to, to have a degree of acceptance of what their challenges are and why they have those challenges, um, which is not an easy conversation either. And we talked about the token economy. That's where we identify the home-based rewards. So we want to be really clear up front. You know, if you get this number of points, Billy, this is what you can earn. You get extra video game time or you get uh, you know, five bonus tokens or whatever it might be that, that turn into something special. Um, it would be great if we can provide school-based rewards, so simple things like stickers or I've had parents send in to school to keep the teacher like a special snack and the child, if they get X number of points, uh, they get the snack at the end of the day to eat on the school bus or something along those lines. Um, nothing with peanuts or things like that, of course. Um, and then, you know, we want to be open to monitoring this and modifying it. So if the child's reaching their goals really easily, we want to make it a little, a little tougher. If they've mastered a goal, which is great, that's the whole point, we want to add a new goal. Um, so you know, we're always open to, to changing, our, changing the, the nuts and bolts of our strategy, but always keeping the structure of it in place, if you will. Um, so the gentleman uh, already you know, kind of asked about, you knew this was coming because you have the handouts in front of you, um, uh, about how to work with this with older students. Uh, there's a couple things. You know, certainly you want to involve the child or the teen in the development of this from, from day one. Um, oftentimes we'll even call these things contracts with our, uh, our older kids um, so that you know, it feels a little bit less like a, uh, a report card or you know, something like that, but it's more like this is my contract with everybody and you feel a little bit older and you're a little bit more involved in it because if we build a contract, I should be part of building that and I've agreed to it. Um, we also sometimes add a self-monitoring uh, component to it so the child may monitor how great of a job did I do finishing my assignments today or or staying focused on the teacher, or you know, did I answer at least two questions today, or raise my hand at least two times to, sh to demonstrate engagement? So we can have that component as well. And the teacher rates the same things, and if they match each other, not only does he get the points, he should get the points for uh, meeting the goal, but he also gets the points for matching what the teacher says. All right, so having a, a good assessment of what they actually did. So this is an example of uh, one of, the, of a daily report card, and you can see. Um, you know, there's, there's different levels of uh, the behavior, and it's based on percentages of the time that they demonstrate the, the target behavior. And you can see the target behaviors are um, completing work in the time allowed, staying in your seat, and following directions the first time. So these are pretty specific things. Um, you, know, ch you know, an elementary school child can probably understand what, what's meant by these things. There's, there's not a lot of ambiguity there. Um, and the teacher can also observe them pretty easily without a lot of thought. Uh, not that teachers can't think, of course. Um, you also see that they're getting rated more than once a day, so there's not a single global rating per day. Uh, for some kids, we also can break this down even more to different subjects so they could get rated four times a day. Uh, you know, the more, you know, in some ways, the more the merrier, if you will, because it's, it's a more of a fine-tuned assessment of what's going on throughout the day. Um, so you can have you know, a rough beginning, but then really recover and get reinforced more for doing that. Um, rather than, you know, you kind of blew the day, you know, within the first couple hours. That, that doesn't really sit too well. You are trying to uh, have a balancing act here because you are asking the teacher to provide a higher level of information about your child on a daily basis than he, she does for the other kids potentially. Um, having a system like this makes it pretty feasible for them to do that. Um, if you start to ask for lots of comments or lots of specific notes, that's where it starts to get a little unwieldy for teachers and you, you run the risk of, of disengagement. Um, I, in a situation like that, I would typically advise the parent to maybe uh, send them a follow-up email about that specific incident um, just to, to find out about it. Um, in the end, you're, you're focused on that goal. So all the specifics may not be as relevant as the goal. You know, so if, if he didn't keep his hands to himself that day, you know, Billy, tell me what happened. Tomorrow, remember, your goal is to keep your hands to yourself, and, and we just stay really you know, goal-focused and not really get bogged down on what happened on any one particular day. Okay. That wasn't completely satisfactory. <laughs> but we do want to move forward. I mean, it's important just to keep moving forward. Um, if you get bogged down on one particular incident, it really can, 
you, you, you start to lose the, 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 the sense of what you're trying to do of being encouraging. And you, you do just want to forgive a mistake as much as we can and move on. The, go the goal would be to, you know, what percent of their classwork did they finish? Because um, we, you know, zoning, daydreaming, paying attention are very hard things to, to rate because they're very hard to observe. Um, they're, not very, they're not very reliable, observable behaviors. Um, you know, I, I can assume people are paying attention, but I don't really know. I assume since you and I are making eye contact and I'm talking to you and you're talking to me that you're paying attention, uh, but for all I know, you're thinking about your checkbook right now. Um, right, well, probably don't. Yeah, whatever. Um, thank you for not thinking about your checkbook right now. Um, but you know, but th th I'm just I'm merely making an assumption. If you are completing a percentage of your work, I know you're completing a percentage of your work, and it's a really good proxy for paying attention because you couldn't complete that percentage of your work without paying attention. And, and quite honestly, if they are bouncing in their seat yet completing their work, they've met their goal and they've done a great job. You know, but, you know, we really don't want to make goals that are probably not that feasible. Sitting still is not a feasible goal um, for, for youngsters with ADHD, for you know, lots of elementary school age kids. Quite frankly, for me most of the time, it's, it's not a feasible goal. So we, we don't want to put down the list. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the homeschool note's not making it home, so this can happen, of course, right? Because our, our kids with ADHD are like, they're, they're forgetful, disorganized, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so we, we may have to provide the, a special folder for them. It's, it's, their, you know, it's their daily report card folder, so it doesn't get shoved into a book bag. It should be made of plastic, um, not paper. Uh, remind the child before they go to school each day to bring the note home. Uh, put it in a special pocket in their book bag or their binder so they can get it really easily. Uh, remember, you know, ask for it. Um, a lot of times parents will say, well, if they ain't give it to me, I ain't rewarding it. Um, it's, you know, your child has a, a real, if they have ADHD, they have a really hard time following those sorts of routines. So, so prompt them, ask them for it. And if they bring it home, if you're having a hard time, just bringing the note home is worth a reward. That's worth tokens right there. I mean, it seems a little silly, but if it's not happening, then the best way to make it happen is to reward it so it does happen. If you're not seeing any change, if nothing's really happening, uh, that usually means that uh, one of the things that, that may mean is that they, they really aren't uh, quite at the point where they're, they're reaching your threshold to earn the reward. So we have to start to lower the threshold temporarily a little bit um, so they can uh, earn the reward. We also have to look at the goals. Uh, it may not be a realistic goal. You may have, you know, in that slide of the example, you may not have the percentages set up the right way. Um, so you, know, you might have to lower some of the percentages of how much they have to complete to get a point or two points or whatever it might be. Um, and making sure that the things that you're asking them to do just simply aren't too difficult. Um, sometimes, you know, we, for all the thoughtfulness we try to put into this, we sometimes come up with things that really aren't that realistic. Are there competing things with uh, the, your goal behavior? So, for instance, if they're not completing their seat work, is it because they get a lot of attention from their next door neighbor um, in the, at the desk for you know, saying things, making funny drawings, uh, things like that, and that's way more rewarding than anything you're going to offer to them. Uh, and then, so therefore, it's a competing reinforcer, and you, you really have to eliminate that, not the child, of course, but eliminate the competing reinforcer uh, because they're, 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 they are both going after the same thing, um, and, and you have to make one stronger than the other. Um, uh, is the reward truly motivating? Sometimes we come up with things that we think are motivating, um, but they really don't matter that much to our child. Um, so you know, engaging the youngster in, uh, you know, is, is video game time really what they might be after? What, what really drives them? It might be coming home and playing Yahtzee with mom when they get home off the school bus. Um, you know, if kids actually know what that game is, of course. Um, but something like that, things that we don't think are that obvious really might be quite rewarding. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we're providing really ample feedback. Uh, we want to you know, make sure that you know, the way we're providing praise is, is the way that makes it really effective. So it's specific. Um, it's not, oh, you know, they pull out the homeschool note. They got 18 points. Oh, you did a great job, Billy. Way to go. Uh, which is nice. It's a praise statement, but it's really not specific enough to what they're doing. So you pull out the homeschool note, and they have three things. Oh, Billy, you, did, you got all your points for completing your work. And you got almost all your points for staying at your chair. And uh, you, you did a really nice job with raising your hand first. It looks like you, you'll work on that a little bit more tomorrow. But overall, you had a really good day. Way to go, pal. Your reward is this, which is, takes a little bit more time in a busy life, of course. But it, it has a lot more weight to it. It's much more salient, which is an important part of effective reinforcement. So we'll move on to everybody's favorite thing, the best part of the day of homework, uh, homework and 
Uh, homework and ADHD go together like um, what, cats and dogs? <laughs> So uh, we know that uh, homework and ADHD uh, are, high, you know, even though they don't necessarily go together, we, there's lots of reasons why they don't. Because uh, homework really hits uh, kids with ADHD kind of where it hurts oftentimes. Uh, our youngsters are, uh, can be quite forgetful on a regular basis, and homework uh, relies upon bringing stuff home, knowing what to do, being able to access information. You know, if the child in a classroom is kind of talking to their neighbor and messing around when the teacher says, remember class uh, tonight, Make sure you do those math problems. Or well, remember, tomorrow's a test. Make sure you study. Uh, but they were really engaged in something else, and they just didn't get it in. Or they got it in, but it got jumbled up with everything else that was much more important to them. Uh, that's the way you know, our, young, you know, our kids with ADHD work. Um, while they're performing homework, uh, it's tough to keep them in the chair. Of course, this is not uh, nearly as interesting as a video game or watching television or watching paint dry. Um, so, you know, getting out of their seat is, is going to happen. Uh, daydreaming, kind of getting off task, uh, you know, wasting time, if you will, is quite commonplace because these kids have a really hard time sustaining attention. And remember, we're asking them to do this after a full day of school. So they've already been to school for X number of hours per day, and they come home and they have to do more schoolwork. Um, there's a lot of task avoidance, a lot of procrastination, a lot of you know, whining, complaining, uh, reasons why they don't have to do homework. Uh, I've had some very um, you know, eloquent speeches given to parents about why they can't do homework. And it's a great time to have philosophical debates about the value of homework. Um, and then just plain not following directions. So not doing what they're told, which can then lead to some of what, what Jen was alluding to earlier. It can lead to a lot of conflict. Of, you know, you know, because parents feel an awful lot of pressure for their youngster to get homework done. Uh, if you don't get, if your child doesn't get their homework done, there's, there's something wrong going on. Uh, and the teacher will see it, and that means I'm a bad parent. And all these different pressures, and my kid's not going to do well in school, and all these things that we attach to homework that, that may be somewhat true, but aren't nearly as true as we, we tend to think that they are. Uh, so homework's a great target behavior um, uh, because it is, it's automatically, it's natural, it's, it's, it's already built in family school collaboration. Um, it is literally um, schoolwork uh, that's coming from school to home to be done. Uh, so it provides a parent a really good indication of what's being done in school, uh, what, you know, what's going on today. You know, if they're, if they're doing two-digit multiplications, that's a good clue that today in class we worked on two-digit multiplications. Um, it involves the parent-child uh, relationship, so you, you know, you're kind of forced to work together with your child if you're doing homework. Um, so if we target homework, if we make it go a little bit better, uh, we can hopefully reduce some of the conflict. Uh, when we talk to parents about this, they, get, they will tell you a majority uh, during the school year if the conflict they have with their youngster is around homework. Um, so if we can really target that, we can really get a nice win on reducing conflict, which can help us gain some traction with other things. Um, and it's a really nice way to shape relationships. You know, if, if you're communicating with the teacher about homework, it's, it's, as I said, it's already there. You're not creating a bridge. Uh, the bridge is already there. So we think about homework strategies <clears throat> breaking down into, into really two components. One are the antecedent-based strategies. And I've heard a couple people say, use the word antecedent, which is great. Uh, well done. Uh, you were here a, a month ago, right? So good. That, that stuck for a month. Nice job. Um, so we, we do some upfront things with homework. Uh, like we negotiate a, t a homework time limit. Uh, uh, the keywords are negotiate and limit. Uh, so we want to establish uh, that there's going to be a homework time limit. And we want to negotiate this with our child and with our teacher, our child's teacher. Um, we don't want to just implement that ourselves by saying, well, I have decreed that you will only spend a half hour on homework. Um, but you do want to say, you know what, Mrs. Smith, uh, I've, been, you know, I've been observing Billy do homework. And after about a half hour, he's just, you know, he's just spent and we just start yelling at each other. And it doesn't go very well. I was really hoping that, you know, would, would it be okay if they, after a half hour, if he's just in the tank, uh, I'll just write a note, you know, would that be okay or something like that. Um, and you know, when, when teachers, I've found when teachers hear the story of what happens in the homework, it, it touches them. I mean, they're, they're human beings. Um, so they, you know, they, they don't want the child to be miserable, uh, generally. Uh, and then we work on the what, when, and where of homework. Uh, what do you actually have to do? If you have an assignment book, it makes it a lot easier, especially if it's monitored by the uh, parent and teacher. Uh, homework has a specific purpose. So if a child's really good at math and they just kind of get it, uh, maybe there can be a reduction of how much math homework they have to do. Uh, so they, they can spend more time doing things that don't quite come as easily. Uh, the when, uh, trying to uh, have a consistent time when the child does homework. 
Um, so not just whenever it's going to happen, but having a set scheduled homework time. So it's predictable and you can count on it as best as you can with after school activities. For children that take medication, it's really important that they do their homework as much as you possibly can when the medication is still in their system. It's still kind of being effective. Otherwise, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle and you're not taking advantage of that medicine you're paying for. Um, and then the where. So and the where should be someplace that balances reducing some distractions. Um, uh, but you don't need a soundproof booth necessarily. Um, and can, can have adequate monitoring. So the child's bedroom, while it may reduce some distractions, um, is really, you know, for many parents, is a really hard place to monitor what's going on because they go up there, they close the door, and you don't know what's going on until they emerge, uh, if they emerge. And, um, uh, you know, so you want to have a place where you can regularly kind of stop by and see how it's going, observe, um, give some positive feedback. Wow, look how much you've gotten done, uh, things like that. Uh, so it's not just this, you know, they go up to the factory and they get it done and they come back when they're done. So those are the antecedents of homework. The other piece is we, we actually use an intervention called uh, homework goal setting. Um, the idea is to set the parent up as a, a homework monitor or a homework supervisor, not a teacher. Um, some parents are teachers. Um, I guess some teachers are parents. But, uh, but most parents are not teachers. They weren't trained to be teachers. Teachers are trained professionals. Uh, they do their job for a good reason. Um, if you're not a teacher, you shouldn't be in a teacher role on a regular basis. Uh, so we want our parents to be supervisors. We want them to be managers, uh, but not necessarily know all that they have to know to, to actually do the homework itself. Uh, we want to break uh, homework down into little bits, subunits of work. Um, makes it much more manageable. We want to focus on breaking things down to work within the child's attention span, not trying to stretch their attention span to, to fit what we want them to do. Uh, we want to work on efficiency. Homework does not have to be all accurate to be OK. It has to be OK. It has to show that your child has some demonstrated knowledge of the skill. And in fact, if they can't do it very well, that's a sign of something. That might be, mean that they really didn't understand the lesson today, and they're struggling with it, and you want the teacher to know that. You don't want to fake the teacher out by saying, well, we, we worked on it for an hour, and my kid really gets it now, and they go to school, and they, they don't really get it, but boy, they got the homework done. And if the teacher sees the homework come back all correct, their assumption is, Billy got it. All right, we can move on. If it comes back half done or mostly incorrect, hopefully that what the teacher will get is, oh, Billy's, Billy's kind of struggling with this. Maybe I have to spend a couple more minutes with him making sure he gets it uh, before we move on. So you know, tough time with homework is a good communication tool. So goal setting is a process where we work with the parent and the child to work on a, a, a series of steps where they can collaborate to establish realistic goals, evaluate the performance on, a, on a, a very consistent basis, and provide a really high rate of positive reinforcement. That's a, that's a real key. So it really is a strategy where it combines some good antecedents as well as uh, heavy doses of positive reinforcement that are coming very frequently. Um, and to carry this out, we use a goal setting tool. Um, and what we, this is our goal setting tool. And what, you can, what you'll see is that we have a component where we Work with the child, the parent works with the child to establish the goal, uh, the number of items completed, how many they're going to get correct, how they rate after they did it, how did they do, and did they reach two different goals, their completion goal, and they get points based on that, and their correctness goal, and they get points based on that. Because if you, if you did all your homework but it's all wrong, well, that should be some benefit to you. Um, you know, because at least you tried. Maybe you didn't quite get it, but you did put the effort out. We want to reinforce the effort. Um, and then they get points, and the points can be built into their token economy, or it can just be a simple stand on, stand on its own system where if you get X number of points by the time homework's done, um, you are eligible for bonus video game time, or you, know, you and dad get to play Madden football together, or you go out back and kick a soccer ball with somebody, something like that. If, if your monitoring rate is high enough, frequently enough, um, you're really focusing on catching them being good. Okay. Um, and it, it's, it's a little bit of a twist in one's thinking uh, because we are, we, as parents, we are oriented, uh, as adults, quite frankly, we are, we are oriented to respond to things we don't like. Uh, we are not naturally inclined to notice and respond to things that we like or that are simply okay. So we have to retrain ourselves to go by on a highly frequent basis and every time we see decent homework behavior, the pencil is touching the paper, um, that we say, you're doing some homework, okay? And that's enough. And if we do that on a highly frequent basis, 
it starts to build on itself. You catch them being good instead of catching them being bad. And, but we're naturally inclined to do that. Um, the very nature of your question, which is a very appropriate question, by the way, I'm not being critical, but the very, that's the question that you get asked all the time is, that all sounds great, but what if they're screwing up? What do I do then? Uh, and there's an answer for that, but, we, but the, the very nature of asking that means that we're not focusing enough on what are they doing, what are we doing when they're doing okay. All right, so we want to demonstrate this homework goal standing strategy because it, it's a little bit easier to, to, to see and understand. And we have uh, one of our fine psychology interns uh, who's, going, who's volunteered, or I supervised, so she didn't have much of a choice. There are ways that you can turn it into kind of a self-monitoring system to say, okay, here's what I need to accomplish for my homework tonight. If I get to this completion goal, this accuracy goal, then I will allow myself this reward, or I'm going to let mom or dad know that this is my goal, and I'm going to try and handle it a little bit more independently than an elementary school student might. Um, you might not look through every single item that your student is completing because they're not going to want that kind of close monitoring. But there are ways, again, that you can keep the spirit of the strategy in place and allow your students more independence. But what we're going to see over here is some homework getting done. You'll see they have materials on the table. So they've already gone through the backpack and taken out all the things you find in your elementary students' backpacks. I've seen some really gross things in the backpacks of kids <laughs> with ADHD. But we've gone through it, we've got our worksheet out, we have pencils ready, so we have all of the materials we need. Heather doesn't need to go anywhere now. The pencils are sharpened, the materials are ready, we've taken a bathroom break, and we're ready to go. We're ready to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we're gonna, do, we're gonna do math homework, okay? No, success. <laughs> success. So they're going to work on the strategy, and I'm going to kind of. So Heather is uh, second or third grade, judging from this homework. Although this is an odd worksheet. There is 26 plus 71 on the same form as 7 plus 1. Yeah, I didn't make the worksheet. <laughs> anyway. It might not all be appropriate for Heather. <laughs> That's right. Not in front of your children, not especially, of right? What's, so what was the teacher thinking? The exactly. Teacher assigned, exactly. And we'll keep the comments about the teacher in okay. our heads. So I have uh, a homework goal setting worksheet, which is the very same thing that was just up on the screen. And uh, Heather and I are going to do some math homework, OK? All right, Heather, uh, you, did, you just finished your reading. Now we're going to do your math, OK, sweetie? Um, so homework so is it looks like you have down. this. looks like you have uh, adding. You're doing adding problems. Great. So let's see. It looks like there are 20 problems on this. Um, and I know uh, you really know your math really well. but Let's see. Um, and so the first thing I'm thinking is, how much time do I really think Heather can work on a math worksheet without you know, kind of getting off task, inattentive, you know, before she starts to crash? And based on my experience with Heather, it's about six minutes okay, <laughs> as a second grader with ADHD. And that's OK. We're not expecting that Heather's doing all of her homework in a sprint or in a marathon. We're breaking this down into short races kind of along the way. So six minutes at a time. So watch how he handles the worksheet. We're not necessarily going to do all of those 20 problems mm -hmm. all at once. So Heather, let's see. Um, how many problems do you think you can do in six minutes? What do you think? Watch out for undershooting goal and Eight. drastically overshooting. Eight problems. OK. Um, I think, I think eight sounds pretty good. I've seen you do math before. You're really good at this and stuff. Adjust if you have so I think to. eight's good. She now, so if she said two, I would say, well, two's OK. But you know, I've seen you do this before. I, I think you could do probably four. Let's go for four. So there's a little bit of negotiation. But remember, you, you are in a bit more of a powerful position, um, at least sometimes. OK? So, so I'm going to write down you're going to do eight problems. And when you do your eight problems, Heather, when you do your eight problems, how many do you think you're going to be able to get right? You think you can get all of them right? Some of them right? Some. Some. You think some means five? Less than five? More than five? Five. Five? OK. Tell you what, I, you know, this, I'm looking at these problems, and, and this looks a lot like yesterday's homework, which you did really great at. So let's go with six. I think you get six of them right. Notice he's not requesting 100%. Okay. All right. Completion so your accuracy. goals are that you're going to do eight of the problems. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Heather, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're going to do up. Start here and do up to there. Okay. 
and you're going to try to get at least six of them right. Do you understand what to do for the worksheet? Yes. OK. Tell me what you have to do. Checking for understanding. I have to do eight of these problems, so up to here. Okay. And what kind of problems are these, Heather? Bad ones. Bad ones? Are they adding ones or subtracting ones? What do you have to do for these problems? Not a bad idea. Add. Add. That's Call right. So you're going to do to eight adding problems. How many times okay. have you seen a Heather, kid with Heather, pick up your pencil, and it's time to start doing your eight adding problems. Go. It's to add, not subtract. You know, we see kids all the time. I'll start my timer. Handy dandy kitchen timer. You can get it at any kitchen store, Target. On your Places microwave, like on your stove. There are timers already in your house, too. But remember, we're externalizing time, just like we talked about early on this evening. If you notice, also, Heather was pretty inattentive early on. Steve maintained his calm, and he just said her You're name. You're trying a problem. Positive reinforcement for the effort. And she's tapping, doing a little bit of fidgeting. We're ignoring that. The so timer. as the parent, I may, I'm not going to hover on top of her. Uh, I may go off for a second uh, or a minute, come back and check and see how she's doing. Uh, if I really think she's struggling, I'll stay a little bit closer. And I'll keep watching for an OK behavior to reinforce. Um, so, uh, you know, so all this stuff that she's doing now, and doing a lot of it, uh, all this stuff that she's doing now, uh, I'm not going to really pay attention to. Oh, you're trying the next, the next problem. Oh, you have two answers down. Way to go, Heather. You're on your way. So I'm really going to work on not responding to behavior that doesn't help her reach her goal and only focus on behavior that will. Even though she's giving me lots of opportunities to, to, to notice other things, uh, I'm not quite sure it's on the floor. Um, <laughs> But, but this is pretty, in, it's, it's way more interesting. And it's much less work than doing this. You know, keep in mind that you know, when kids are procrastinating or not doing their work, there, two things are happening. Number one is they are not putting forth the effort. Number two is there's a degree of pleasure in avoiding work. Um, you know, if you've ever procrastinated any kind of work task, your taxes, your bills, I'm talking here. She's working. All right, good job, Heather. <laughs> You've gotten three <laughs> problems right. Way to go. You're almost there. Don't want to miss an opportunity when the opportunities well, might be rare. Why don't you lecture while uh, I'm doing just, it? No, I'm just helping make sure we're noticing Heather. Everyone was noticing Heather. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> don't fight while you're on their <laughs> Maybe one parent needs to be in charge of homework. How many times have you felt like sure. you know, homework is described as Oh, World another War one's III. done. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Setting this kind of structure up is taking you away from some of the, the arguments that are naturally already happening during homework. So that there's a time limit. There's a structure. We're giving you very clear rules about what you should Six and should be doing. Six problems done. So that the, the point is to try and reshape the whole homework situation, because we know that You're homework is You're working really hard, like Heather. World War III for kids. I usually don't point it out too much, unless I can use it in a positive way. So this, would, this may be, you've gotten six problems left, and there's still three minutes, something like that. But not, there's only 20 seconds to go, Heather. Get it done. <laughs> Heather, you finished all eight problems. All right. So now I am up to my next step, which is how did I do? We're going to rate performance. So Heather, you said you were going to finish eight problems in the six minutes, and you finished all eight of them. Way to go. All right. And I'm going to check them really quickly. And it looks like you got eight of them right. They're all, cor they're all correct. Way to go. You met that goal. So did I reach my completion goal? Um, she actually did. So she gets a point for reaching her completion goal. Did I reach my cor correctness goal? She actually got more correct than we anticipated, which is a good reason to set the bar a little bit lower. Because then she gets a bonus point for getting the above the goal. Doesn't this feel great? You're like totally not seven, but doesn't it feel good? So she gets two plus one is three points for that one unit of homework. Now we have you know probably ten more math problems to do, or a little bit more. So we would split it up again, do the same thing. So one math worksheet could be three units of homework. 
Um, and by, by breaking this down this way, we are actually tripling, quadrupling the amount of reinforcement that we can give for having her uh, work in little tiny units at a time. Um, and it did feel good, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that in between each unit, we would give a very short break, a minute or two minutes just to recover. Uh, not time to go watch TV, play video games, or anything like that. But if she has to go to the bathroom suddenly, um, you know, that's enough time to do that or drink some water or something like that. Uh, but it's a very short break. Okay? And sometimes just that period of review and going over points is sufficient as a break because now I get to stop. I'm not working right now. I'm watching and interacting with my parent and I'm getting some good positive reinforcement and I'm kind of pausing on the active work. So that's where for some kids it's just <laughs> using that break and continuing without letting them get up from the table suits you better. Yeah. So you have to know your kids too. It's like once they get up from the table, it doesn't matter yeah. how long you said the break is, sometimes they're gone. So think about, you know, is coming back to the table too difficult? Then try and, if you can, hold off on letting them get up. But just a break while sitting there uh, is okay, brief, and right. then back to work. For older kids, sometimes we'll have a book at the table, like a, you know, a, a leisure book, something they like, so they can read a book for a minute or two as they're breaking, and then we get right back to their homework, so they're not getting up and down all the time, uh, which, can be, which can be kind of problematic, because then it, you're creating an opportunity just to have to give more directions, which we want to try to avoid. Now, one thing I just want to point out with that is Heather did finish all eight of those problems that were established in her goal. If she had only finished six or seven of them, we would have, she would not have met her goal we would have acknowledged that, and not with a whole lot of talking, just, you know, we, we had a little bit of a hard time getting to our goal, but her correctness goal, she still met. So she gets points for that, so there's room for positive reinforcement. Then we leave those incomplete problems incomplete and move on to the next unit. I see it kills parents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm going to send her homework back unfinished? Yes, absolutely which is partly why the discussion earlier was when we start doing these kinds of homework interventions, you definitely want to be partnering with your child's teacher so that they know we're trying some things and we're going to make some changes in the way that homework is going at home right now. You might see a dip in terms of homework completion with the goal of Heather realizing it's not too many times that a kid needs to go through and actually see zero points, I didn't meet my goal, to start to feel more motivated to work more efficiently and get more done. So there might be a drop in completion for a little while with the goal of increasing completion over time. If at the end Heather had said, okay, I finished this unit, I didn't, I didn't meet my goal, I didn't finish those two problems, <coughs> they moved through, finished that worksheet, and then Heather said, if I go back and finish these two problems, can I get a point? That's up to you to negotiate, but I would say absolutely. She's now set recognizing I didn't finish, I should finish. When I finish my work, good things happen. And so she's recognizing I should go back, I should check my work, I should try to finish it. You know, for a high school student who is partway completing their homework, how do you handle that? Yes? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is about setting contingencies about it. So, um, you know, setting a reasonable goal and setting up a system for what they have, actually have to accomplish beforehand, not in reaction to what they actually did, uh, is really the key there. So whatever their, whatever their, their um, privileges are or things that they want to be able to do at the end of the day, um, you make contingent on reaching a goal for how much of your homework you do. And if you don't reach that goal, then I don't deliver that privilege. Um, so if you're doing 60% of it, uh, but we negotiated that you would do 80% of your homework, uh, because let's face it, 80% is better than 60, which is better than none. Um, it may not be perfection, but we could work up to that eventually. When we're dealing with uh, school performance, it can be very challenging for many children with ADHD. In fact, it is uh, probably the primary reason why uh, children or their parents uh, who are dealing with ADHD seek treatment for their child or gets them to, their, to an office in the first place. Uh, that uh, we really want to make sure that positive reinforcement is uh, the primary strategy used to support behavior change, as Jen pointed out, it is the single best strategy that we have in our, in our little toolbox uh, to foster learning new skills and changing behavior. So we want to always go with a positive reinforcement oriented strategy first. Uh, we are not trying to use uh, punishment as the hammer, if you will, to, to get better school performance. Uh, two, you know, uh, building a collaborative uh, commu uh, uh, relationship with the teacher that's based on uh, clear communication, regular communication, 
uh, praising the teacher for their effort, recognizing the teacher's extra effort because they are going above and beyond, especially nowadays with all the pressures that teachers have to face um, in helping your child. Um, so you know, engaging them in the plan, engaging them in the feedback, uh, giving them feedback, uh, showing them appreciation, um, a little bit of you know, rewarding the teacher, sending in you know, uh, the occasional gift card or, car, you know, or you know, thank you card or something like that goes a long way. Uh, making the expectations for your child very clear. So the gentleman's question that you just asked is really about clear expectations. You know, we're going to establish this is how much homework I expect you to do, and we're going to stick to that. Or this is when homework is supposed to get started, and we're going to stick to this. It's not variable depending on whatever is going on. Um, providing specific feedback uh, on, a, on a frequent and consistent basis. Monitoring is key. Um, you, always want to, you don't want to be on top of your child in the sense that you know, you're, you're always criticizing what they want to do, what they're doing, uh, but you do want to communicate it with them regularly and giving them lots of feedback. And if you can make it okay or positive feedback, all the better. Uh, but you want to you want to make it really frequent and consistent, and you want to stay on top of things. Um, and consider using any form of a daily report card um, in, in any form you can make it, whether it's simply logging on to PowerSchool together and looking at things and rewarding based on you know uh, you know there's no zeros today. Great job! You get to use your cell phone, or you know you get bonus time on the Xbox or whatever it might be, or the daily report cards that we showed you today. Uh, and last. Uh, we always want as much as we possibly can to give our feedback, give our reinforcement at the point of performance. Um, so it's saying something that's going to happen later on or giving feedback about something that happened eight hours ago just doesn't really get us very far. Um, but as much as we can use things at the point of performance, uh, the better off that we are and the more behavioral change that we'll have, we'll foster. Okay. All right, so that is our, I think that's, that's our presentation. Uh, but please, any questions that you have. So the question was, can symptoms related to ADHD be specific to a particular academic content area, or is it seen across the board? Um, now, when we're talking about homework in particular, we can see kids with ADHD have more difficulty in certain academic content areas than others. But if we were making a diagnosis and we were looking fully at that child in terms of performance in school. If you're telling me that we're seeing a child who's only struggling and only showing behavioral difficulties during one particular period of the day and then during one particular content area of homework, I would be more inclined to think we may have a learning problem, a learning disability. So when we're looking broadly at making the diagnosis, ADHD symptoms need to be shown across environments, so home and school, across different periods of the day, different academic content areas. So, you know, the, we would want to look at that carefully before we made a specific determination about that particular child. That said, for certain kids with ADHD, they can have ADHD and a learning disability. So it's possible that, yes, you do see symptoms of ADHD sort of, you know, turned up the volume when they're working on certain academic content areas because they also have learning problems in that area. So it, it's a hard question to answer without more kind of diagnostic information. So the, you know, the emphasis is not the timer. It's not a race against the clock. And it, it's a subtle, it is a bit of a subtle thing. We're really emphasizing how many items can you get right. That The time is really to place some, a little bit more structure around it so it's not this open-ended task. So you know when they're going to, you know, kind of giving a guide. It's more of a time guideline, quite frankly, than a time limit. Um, if you think, you know, if a parent, you know, it, you know, takes this home and they experience it and they try it out and they say, well, at the time just freaked them out. Uh, there's certain, you know, as, a, as an interventionist, that there's certain things I'll let go of, and that would be one of them. And say, listen, if th that seems to be interfering with the whole thing, being everything else seemed to click, we'll get rid of the time. We'll just, you know, just keep it in your head. Uh, but the idea, it's a, it's a time guideline, really, not so much a time limit, if you will. It, it's really just there to place some structure around it. And when you think about the time guideline that you're choosing, you want to make sure you're allowing a reasonable amount of time for the child to get done what you're asking them to do so that it's not feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to race to this thing that's unattainable for me. But really, I have plenty of time to do what I need to do. I'm just more aware now what five minutes, 10 minutes equals. The other thing I see sometimes for kids with timers is it becomes another distraction if it's sitting on the table. It was not the case when Heather was giving us our example. She was inattentive with other things, but sometimes kids will just stare at the timer 
and then they're not looking at their work. So maybe relocating the timer is important. So these things need to be tweaked a little bit as you learn how your kids respond to the different kinds of strategies that we use. The last thing to emphasize with that um, um, is really that the time is also there for you to have a good understanding of you know, what should you expect. You know, if, after you've observed your child, how long can they really stay focused on homework? And that, that's your time guideline. It's that, you know, and that should guide how many problems you're going to choose or how many items they're going to do. Because um, you're trying to stay within their, within their attention span, not to stretch their attention span to fit something that doesn't fit. Right, and so earlier I presented some methods of trying to build a positive relationship from the start, which it sounds like you did try to do, but we're still having challenges with getting a teacher on board with the strategies. The reality is you're all going to encounter at least one teacher that is harder to partner with over the course of your kid's education. It's the, I'm glad to hear that it is the first time in your case. I really do hope it's the last, but it might not be. And that, so, you know, I'm sure other parents in the room can really relate to this. When you get to a teacher that might be more challenging to partner with, there might come a time where it really serves you well to find someone else in the school building, like the school psychologist, the guidance counselor, last year's teacher who really bought into the strategy and found it very helpful. These people can kind of help grease the wheels for you a little bit to get the teacher more engaged and more involved. At other times, there are people like us who make phone calls to teachers to try to advocate for your family and for your child and really help emphasize the importance of using strategies that are effective. So there, there really are times when it's very, very difficult for a parent to do all of that partnering work themselves. And if you feel like you need to get some support within the building or externally, that there might come a time when that is necessary. And then you want to provide some affirmation of the teacher that I really appreciate the feedback I got. Exactly. And it really is when... Even though it hurts to do so. Yeah. Exactly. Catch the teacher being good, just like you're working on catching your kids being good. And sometimes it is really hard to do that. You're your children's best advocates when you're working with the school environments. And sometimes it is a question of starting in the spring the year before yeah. in terms of building a good positive relationship with the teacher you have next year. If you've been in a group of first graders recently, uh, but certain bodily habits tend to be quite humorous. Um, so there's a certain degree of age appropriateness that uh, simply you're not going to get rid of and uh, you will have to ignore it and tolerate it. Um, that being said, if, you wanted, if that's a behavior that you'd like to reduce, the single best thing you can do is to find an alternative behavior and reinforce the heck out of it. Um, so using nice words, using appropriate words, things like that, <clears throat> um, and then catching it when it happens. So focus on what he is doing. The other thing is when you have other kids in your house, if your younger son isn't doing it, he's a good model. Catch him demonstrating the behavior that you want your other son to use. So you're doing a really good job using kind words. Don't say anything to your other child. Not like, why can't you be more like your brother? But just notice the sibling. You're doing a really nice job using kind words. And then the other son sees, oh, I get attention when I'm doing what he's doing. So then as soon as he does it, you're all over that. You did a really good job using kind words right now. It starts to get to the point where this positive reinforcement, the praise stuff, you're getting on the right track when you start to feel like you're being totally hokey. That's what I start to tell parents. <laughs> you want so much praise that it starts to feel a little bit hokey. It will start to feel more comfortable for you once it becomes a natural part of your habits too. You're asking yourselves to change your behavior as well. So remember that. When, if we're trying to change our kids' behavior, a lot of times it means we need to change a lot of what we're doing too. And behavior change is a process. This is not going to turn on a dime. It's like turning it's a cruise old. ship. Yeah. <laughs> it's like turning a cruise ship, you know, in, in a tight space. It's a slow process. And so you need to kind of, don't look at me like that. You need to, <laughs> you need to take the time and recognize the little steps along the way for your kids' behavior change as well as yours and for the teachers. We're all trying to make big changes here, and it's, it takes time to do it. I, I don't think there's a short answer to that because really there's a whole set of strategies that one can use for that. Um, when Jen was presenting about the token economy, I mean, we did a, a short version of that uh, this evening because this is more focused on school. Um, about a month ago, we, we had another workshop that was more focused on home behavioral change. Um, so we talked a little bit more about that. Um, but you know, that, you know, using a token economy, uh, that's often a very uh, appropriate and very useful target behavior 
for a token economy is every time you give a direction, and there's a whole series of steps one has to use to give an effective direction. Uh, but when, you, when a parent gives an effective direction and the child follows it the first time, it's always, always, always a token. Um, and that's how you make the change happen. And then if the tokens are valued, they can be traded in for something of value, uh, then you can usually foster a nice behavior change for that, especially for an elementary school age child. So you can certainly use a token economy throughout your house. It's possible and very likely that different kids are going to need slightly different goals, though, right? Because if you're, you have different ages, sure. but you also have different ability levels. So if you know that one child every single time follows directions the first time, and then your child with ADHD very rarely does, that sets up kind of a disparity between the kids that could potentially be problematic, but the other child likely has something else that they could be working on, that then you know this becomes sort of a system that's throughout your house. Just like giving directions or increasing the chances that we're going to follow directions the first time, building a token economy that works in your home takes multiple steps and a lot of guidance. So the other workshop for parents has the information around that. The other thing would be to work with a psychologist or a provider around to help you build these kind of strategies and use them consistently and effectively in your home. And thank you very much for listening.